This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it is my pleasure this morning to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Anitha John. She is director of the Washington Adult Congenital Heart Program in, in DC, based out of DC Children's Hospital. She did her undergraduate training at Villanova and then went on to Drexel to get an MD, PhD, and from there did training in MedPeds pediatric cardiology, and then went to the Mayo Clinic for adult congenital cardiology. She loves to train, and she is very good at what she does. I'm looking forward to hearing about assembling the puzzle of the adult congenital heart field. All right, thank you so much, Wendy. Wendy's been an inspiration to me and to many of us in the field. I think the program that she's designed here is something that we all try to emulate, so it's a great honor for me to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about adult congenital cardiology. Um, it's a complicated field, and we're going to try and see if we can assemble some of the puzzle pieces. My parents thought by this point in my career I would have some financial disclosures. Sadly, I have none. Um, so the objectives for our talk, we'll talk briefly about uh, the growth and some of the clinical needs of the adult congenital population. I think most of you have been exposed to this patient population and probably know uh, a number of the growing needs, uh, but we're going to spend the bulk of the talk talking about um, some of the programmatic initiatives that we've instituted in DC to help improve care for these patients, and then also to talk a bit about some of the ongoing research initiatives and some national progress that's being made on uh, these various initiatives. So let's start the talk by uh, presenting a patient case. This is baby Olivia. This is a patient who was born during my very first week of fellowship. Uh, she was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which many of you have probably seen in some of the adult patients that are getting admitted with Fontan physiology. It's a pretty rare syndrome. It's uh, two patients per 10,000 live births. Uh, it involves uh, deformities of the mitral and the aortic valve, resulting in a hypoplastic left ventricle. As with most forms of congenital heart disease, survival has dramatically improved with surgical advancements. Olivia, however, had a twist to her story. Uh, never say never in congenital heart disease is a favorite statement of Jane Somerville. Um, she also had scimitar syndrome in addition to the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And most of you probably know what scimitar syndrome is as well, too. It's partial anomalous pulmonary venous return that returns back through the IVC to the heart. These patients usually have a hypoplastic right lung, which makes the Fontan palliation very difficult, can also make transplantation very difficult as well, too. At the time when she was born, she was the eighth reported case, um, and she was the first case of a fetal diagnosis. <clears throat> when thinking about prognosis for baby Olivia, we unfortunately did not have very good things to offer her family. Uh, there were no reported survivors at that time. And palliative care was presented as a really viable option, uh, even during fetal counseling as well, too. Uh, Olivia was the result uh, of an IVF pregnancy after many, many years of her parents trying to start a family, and they decided that they did not want to pursue palliative care, and they were willing to undergo a procedure despite the risks uh, on the offshot that she would actually survive. Um, so I'm going to stop Olivia's story here, and I think with most anything, you really can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. Um, congenital heart disease, the field itself has really evolved over the past uh, 50 to 60 years with the advent of new diagnostic tools and various different surgical techniques. It's important to remember, though, that this is still a pretty young field, and this is why we're seeing sort of an onslaught of patients that are coming now because of all of the uh, various different changes in the time frames in, in which this occurred. So if you think about the blalock talsic shunt and the first open heart surgery, this occurred in the mid-1940s and early 1950s. This was followed uh, shortly by the Rashkin balloon atrial septostomy that uh, was uh, available to patients in 1960. Uh, just an interesting side note, I trained at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for my pediatric cardiology fellowship where Dr. Rashkin worked for many years. And the rumor was, as part of the balloon atrial septostomy, was actually developed in his garage. Uh, on various different experimental protocols that he designed there. So try and get that through the IRB uh, these days. Um, infant surgery really was not a viable option till the late 70s. 
Um, and prenatal diagnosis really wasn't possible until shortly after that time either. And for patients like Olivia with hypoplastic left heart, the two surgical strategies that were being developed in the early 1980s were infant heart transplant, which was pioneered by Dr. Len Bailey at Loma Linda, and also the Norwood procedure, which was uh, pioneered by Dr. Bill Norwood at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, all around the same time in the early 80s. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of sort of the time frame of when you're seeing uh, the evolution of various different types of patients presenting. The game changer for patients with critical congenital heart disease really came in the late 1970s when prostaglandins became available. This is when infant mortality really improved. Combining this with the various different types of diagnostic tools and surgical techniques, infant survival increased to 80 to 90 percent at this point, even for those complex lesions, which is why you're seeing a lot of patients with complex con uh, congenital heart disease that are presenting now in adulthood. So this has resulted in a markedly increased survival. For the first time, there are more adults out there with congenital heart disease than there are children. And as you know from taking care of these mm -hmm. folks, these patients have a very unique set of healthcare needs. So let's talk about the first puzzle piece, innovations in clinical care. That's really the foundation, I think, of congenital heart disease and the reason why our adult patients are now surviving uh, late into their adulthood. Um, when you look at U.S. population estimates, it's estimated that there are over 1.3 million adults out there in the United States with congenital heart disease. We unfortunately don't have a national registry system, so this is based on survival rates and uh, uh, estimates that have been extrapolated from Canadian data. Um, when you look at our various different clinics across the country, this is our volume in our uh, adult congenital clinic in D.C. over the past 10 years. You can see that this really mirrors um, what the national trends have been, and pretty much every program across the country is reporting this. If you build it, they will come. Um, there are over 1,700 active patients that we have in our database currently. So it's not just patients with simple heart disease that are surviving. If you start to look at the complex CHD population, it's the same thing that has happened over the past 30 years, really has happened over the past 10 years, that the number of adults alive with congenital heart disease uh, complex congenital heart disease outnumber the number of kids that are alive with congenital heart disease. This is data from Ariane Morelli's group from uh, Montreal using the Quebec databases. They have these lovely nationalized database systems that allow for this type of analysis. And you can see from 2000 to 2010, when she's looking at just the complex CHD population, about 60% of those patients are 18 years or older. This is also reflected in what we're seeing in our clinics. I'm sure Wendy and her team would agree as well. About 80% of our patients are in the moderate to severe complexity range for um, adult congenital heart disease. And so this makes clinics sometimes quite a bit challenging when you have uh, 12 to 14 patients scheduled and you've got a series of mustards and fun tans and uh, transpositions and various other um, you know, disease states that uh, have their own set of complications. So not surprisingly, uh, healthcare utilization in the U.S. has increased dramatically. This is a study that was published almost 10 years ago now using the national inpatient sample that showed that there was an 100% increase in ACHD hospitalizations for the 10 years prior, with 20% of those admissions uh, for CHD-related surgeries. This is mimicked uh, when looking at other areas around the world. The Royal Brompton Hospital reported that the fastest growing users of both outpatient and inpatient services were adult congenital patients over the age of 18. Um, interestingly, across the U.S., a number of uh, adult congenital patients are still admitted to pediatric hospitals. This is a study that was done by one of our fellows, uh, Jonathan Chan, who looked at the FIS database um, examining the number of ACHD heart failure admissions that had come into pediatric institutions. And not surprisingly, the number of admissions has risen over the past uh, 10 years. When you look at the national inpatient sample, which is largely adult care facilities versus the pediatric health information system, um, the average cost and length of stay is pretty similar for ACHD admissions. Uh, however, when you look at the age range, not surprisingly, the patients that are admitted to pediatric hospitals are younger, age 18 to 30, and the vast majority of them have single ventricle anatomy, which likely represents the failing Fontan population. Um, looking at patients who are the high resource utilizers, definitely the folks within the pediatric hospitals have a higher cost ratio, 
Um, they had a higher mortality rate, and also not surprisingly, this was very closely tied to the no uh, level of non-cardiac comorbidities. So almost 80% of patients had at least one non-cardiac comorbidity, and that definitely increased the cost and also uh, was associated with the mortality rate as well, too. And this is often what we're seeing in our clinic as well. Uh, it's not just residual cardiac lesions that we're dealing with. We find that our patients have multi-organ system involvement with kidney issues, clotting disorders, liver dysfunction, restrictive lung disease. Many have underlying psychiatric issues and mood disturbances. And then in addition to that, a lot of them have complex needs uh, to be cared for during pregnancy and have unique contraception requirements as well, too. So really, ACHD extends beyond the heart. You really have to have sort of a good facility of understanding what has been happening to the entire uh, body during their lifespan. One way that we have been trying to tackle this, especially in the Fontan population, is we've established a collaboration with the NIH, uh, specifically with the NIDDK at the clinical centers in Bethesda, to establish a multidisciplinary ACHD Fontan evaluation. This has been a program that's been in design for the past three or four years. We actually launched over the past year and have had about 40 patients that have been enrolled and are continuing to enroll. Um, I think based on our experience in the adult congenital clinic, there was a lot of interest uh, amongst our pediatric colleagues to really try and bridge this uh, tie. Um, there's an, a, a pretty well-detailed single ventricle program for the infant stage, but that in-between stage of 1 to 18, uh, really there was not a concerted uh, way to follow up those patients. So we've uh, gone ahead and extended this to design a multidisciplinary Fontan program that extends across the lifespan at Children's, really with the goal of optimizing care uh, with uh, patients uh, with Fontan physiology throughout the lifespan. How we've proposed doing this is through a Fontan board, similar to a tumor board. Um, this is a multidisciplinary team that would be meeting uh, one to two times per month. Our proposed schema for this uh, patients would be referred in uh, through either their primary cardiologist or through the uh, single ventricle program with an initial visit with some pre prescribed uh, testing. Uh, the case would then be presented at the Fontan board, similar to how you would present a case at a tumor board. And a set of recommendations would be generated based on the patient history that would then be distributed to the patient's primary cardiologist, uh, primary physician, and to the patient and family. Uh, there would be a set of prescribed um, visits, and uh, the patient would be reassessed and present to the board after scheduled visits or if any concerns occur. Um, we've been beginning to use telemedicine very heavily within our program, and so likely for this program, what would happen is that patients would have telemedicine visits with our advanced practitioner every six months to make sure that they are staying on target with their recommendations. And this is something that we are planning to extend to the pediatric population. So basically, once they get their Fontan, they would enter into this program and hopefully would institute more seamless transition. Um, the recommendations are going to be patient-specific, which I think is pretty unique. Uh, and uh, hopefully, they will be able to enroll into our transition protocols, which I'll talk about a little bit later in, in this talk. Um, one of the primary uh, motivators for developing this program was to really generate protocols for specific um, screening, especially for end organ system involvement, and also for cardiac testing as well, too, and also to provide a guide for physicians as to when to initiate the referral to uh, the uh, advanced cardiac therapies team and to the adult congenital team. Um, all patients would also follow up with the neurodevelopmental clinic, uh, hopefully preventing any fallouts, especially of this high-risk population. Many of our patients, as Wendy can attest and the rest of our group can attest, have never had any type of psychiatric or neurodevelopmental assessment, and most have some issues that really they've just kind of dealt with throughout their life. And so we're trying to tackle that from the beginning this time. Um, nationally, this has also taken off. There is an initiative that has been in this uh, process of being organized for the past two years, which would be a Fontan Outcomes Network. There is a pretty uh, detailed network that already exists for single ventricle patients in the interstage period, so basically from birth to about a year of age. Um, folks may be familiar with the Australian New Zealand Registry. This is a registry that was established and launched in 2009. A number of publications have come out looking at long-term outcomes of Fontan patients as they grow older. And it was really this registry that kind of served as the fodder for thinking about um, the design of a long-term outcomes registry that would be uh, throughout the U.S. There are multiple different groups that are involved. I've listed them all out here. 
Um, they really have come up with uh, three different design workshops, physical health and functioning, neurodevelopment, and emotional health and resilience is kind of the key points to tackle in the design of this uh, registry. I got involved over the past few months as they were developing uh, the um, purpose of this registry really with you know, keeping in mind long-term outcomes, um, getting adult congenital heart disease uh, and adult congenital heart disease representation involved I think was critical. And so we've been trying to figure out how to sort of piece all of our various different research interests together, but this is a really exciting initiative that is underway and uh, hopefully in the next year or two uh, we'll have a uh, um, have a have a more uh, significant launch. Do we all need to leave? I don't want to keep you here in a fire for my talk. <laughs> all right. So another area where um, multidisciplinary involvement is really important is in the care of our pregnant patients. Um, the Special Mom Special Babies program was developed by Dr. Melissa Fries, who is the head of OBGYN at uh, MedStar Washington Hospital System, and she has really been critical. Um, in helping us with the management of our uh, complex cardiac patients who are pregnant. Um, she also cares for women who are carrying patients with, uh, carrying babies with congenital heart disease, so works very closely with our pediatric cardiologists as well. Similar to what I showed you before, really care coordination is often key in caring for these patients. So not only uh, the maternal fetal medicine team, uh, but all sorts of branches of cardiology and cardiac surgery often need to get involved. Uh, cardiac nursing and obstetrical nursing have been key to designing care plans for these patients. Having input from both OB and cardiac anesthesia, social work and psychiatry, and neonatology, and fetal medicine. So usually when we have, we have a monthly care conference where we discuss our patients similar to, I think, what is uh, done here at Emory as well too, and we usually have representatives from uh, all of the various different fields that are there to help design a care plan. And we do also try and include the patient and family whenever possible, especially towards the later stages of the discussion. Interestingly, when my colleagues call me from across the country to ask for assistance with things, they're not really calling to ask about what the latest research project is that we're involved. They're asking for clinical protocols. So we actually published our uh, templates for our uh, clinical protocols for vaginal delivery and cesarean section a few years ago. Um, and these are just, you know, sort of general templates. People can modify them, but use as a guide when you're designing what is it that you need to think about uh, in designing the care plan for these patients as they approach delivery. This has been very helpful to have in the patient's chart. Uh, it may not always be us that's there at the hospital when they come in, and so having that there often alleviates a lot of anxiety for the care providers because this is there and, and pretty well laid out. Some of the other initiatives that have been <clears throat> going on in our program, we really try and get everybody involved and try and utilize uh, our staff to the fullest and try and uh, you know really expand on their interests. So, uh, Nancy Klein, our nurse coordinator for our program, had really been interested in trying to improve the advanced directive completion rate in our patients. And so she launched a study uh, where we looked at a total of 341 patients over the course of a year a few years ago. Not surprisingly, only about 17% of our patients had completed an advanced directive or a power of attorney. And this was irrespective of disease complexity. When we looked at a multivariate uh, analysis, education and living with either a spouse or children uh, were factors that were associated with an increased rate of completion. So what Nancy did then at that time was launched an educational initiative. She designed a uh, booklet with some very easy to understand uh, language about what an advanced directive is, resources that patients could turn to. And this launched as a nursing initiative within, uh, initially within our program, but now is actually a hospital-wide initiative where nurses, when they check in, patients have to ask whether they have an advanced directive. If they don't have one, this document is given to them and then actually gone over with the nurse who's uh, checking them in. Um, we uh, reanalyzed uh, our data, and of the initial uh, cohort, about 243 patients had undergone the intervention and had a visit following. Um, there was an increase in the number of patients who had a power of attorney or advanced directive. Uh, we also included discussion with the family uh, in that number percentage as well too, and it increased from 26% to 41%. And interestingly, education fell out as a factor uh, that was associated. So living with a spouse or a child still was associated with increased completion, but race and education were no longer, um, you know, were no longer significant in the analysis, which I think is, is, uh, is pretty impressive. 
So this has now actually turned, been turned into a hospital-wide initiative at the Children's Hospital. So any patient, regardless of what specialty, who's older than the age of 18, this is a protocol that is required and documentation that's required within the EMR. So the ACHA accreditation program, we, I think our programs, Wendy went through this at the same time cycle, uh, involved a lot of paperwork, a lot of paperwork. But one of the things that I think we're all hoping is that as a result of this is that we can share our clinical protocols with each other so that we're not reinventing the wheel. These are common issues that exist across the board and I think trying to figure out the best way to address some of these issues um, will really be by pooling our resources and pooling our data to see what works. So let's go back to baby Olivia. What are the options for her? It's hard to determine what the options are when you have no living survivors and there's only you know, been a handful of cases that have been reported across the world. So as I said, her family really did not want to pursue palliative care as an option and she ended up undergoing what's called a hybrid procedure. Anybody here heard of a hybrid procedure before? Okay, it's all congenital people. Right? Matt, that's good. I'm glad you've heard of it. <laughs> so a hybrid procedure involves putting uh, two pulmonary artery bands. So there are bands that are placed on both pulmonary arteries. A stent goes in the PDA and a stent goes in the atrial septum. I'm not gonna explain the physiology because that'll be a whole separate talk in and of, it, in and of itself, but it is a, a way to sort of mimic that stage one surgery without doing the full surgery. And then she was listed for transplantation. Uh, at about four months of age, uh, she uh, underwent a heart transplant and unfortunately, later that evening did not do particularly well. The graft was not functioning well. I will always remember Olivia because this is the first patient that I ever did chest compressions on an open chest. Um, so she ended up having to be crashed on ECMO that night. And we again were left with, you know, the question of was this the right thing to do? So let's move to the next puzzle piece, patient and provider education. It's really hard to educate folks um, and educate uh, trainees on what the best thing is to do when you don't really have a precedent. So oftentimes you have to do the best you can uh, with really understanding what the physiology is and understanding what uh, the pattern has been in other types of heart diseases to make a decision going forward. It's not uncommon that we get <coughs> patients where we really have no precedent on exactly what the next best step is. Um, just a few words about what we do at our program. We don't have an advanced ACHD fellowship uh, currently, although it's something that we're working on, but we do offer subspecialty rotations to both pediatric and adult cardiology fellows. Uh, there are a number of fellows that have uh, had their continuity clinic with us to gain more experience in taking care of these patients, and we do have a pretty robust lecture series, not only for the um, cardiology fellows, but also for the OBGYN and MFM uh, residents and fellows as well. Uh, some of us take a little bit more of a hands-on approach. This is my colleague, Dr. Seiji Ito. Uh, he was uh, doing a lecture on uh, exercise stress testing and decided to actually do a stress test himself uh, to show uh, the fellows uh, what they needed to be uh, looking for. This won him appropriately a, a fellow teaching award last year, so I like showing that, showing that picture. We also have done a lot of uh, patient education as well too. I think we have realized that really in order to empower our patients, uh, it's important to provide them with the tools that they need for managing their own health care. So My Health, My Heart was a program that we launched in January of 2017. We've run it a few, on a few occasions now. Um, our initial run, we had just 14 participants. We had meant to keep it pretty small at that time, uh, really focusing on older adolescents and uh, young adults. Uh, we had active participation by the Adult Control Heart Association, and this was run largely by our staff, and this was funded by um, some generous sponsorship from the Meal Family Foundation. The focus of the program really was to try and provide patients with the tools that they needed to manage their own health care. So we had sessions where uh, our nurses talked about recognizing cardiac symptoms, how to find a provider, how to manage your medications. Uh, there was a review of the various apps that were on the market that sometimes can assist with managing uh, lots of different medications and managing appointments. Um, our social workers did come and talk about health care rights and advanced directives as well. Uh, interestingly, the session that got the highest rating was the session on mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, at the end of the day, we had one of our nurse scientists who had focused her PhD education on yoga and mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, in the adolescent population came and provided our attendees with some practical tips and tools of how to deal with stress and anxiety. And we ended the session with 
uh, a uh, yoga session, and uh, all of the surprisingly enough, all of the all of the participants really enjoyed this, um, and uh, you know were full participants. So that was the thing when we did our follow up study of what they found to be the most useful. A number of them had signed up for yoga classes after that, and, and had felt it to, to be useful in their life. So based on some of the feedback that we received and a lot of the screening that we have instituted in our clinics, we've also launched a mental health and well-being program as well that utilizes the strengths. Vicki Friedenberg is the woman who was leading the, loca, uh, the uh, yoga session. Um, I think most people probably know there uh, is a high incidence of underlying mood disorder in adult congenital heart disease patients, up to 40%, and some studies have been reported to have um, an undiagnosed form of a mood disorder. And anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, depending on what study you look at, patients have some symptoms of PTSD, which we encounter pretty frequently, especially when patients are coming into the hospital um, for procedures. So our social worker, Emily Stein, uh, launched an initiative um, working with Vicki Friedenberg about uh, trying to improve the mental health and well-being of our patients. And as part of this program, uh, we started with doing an annual psychosocial evaluation. Right now, we're just doing them on patients who uh, have positive screens at our initial visits, but our hope is to eventually be able to offer this to any patient who would want this. Um, we've also introduced mindfulness-based stress reduction and hypnotherapy as adjunct therapy. So Emily has also trained uh, in mindfulness-based stress reduction and recently became certified as a hypnotherapist as well, too. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, there have been actually a lot of uh, research papers looking at hypnotherapy as an adjunct therapy to patients who are undergoing cardiac procedures. This is not really in the adult congenital population, but in the general population. Um, it's increased length of stay, and it, or excuse me, it's decreased length of stay, and it's decreased uh, pain medication requirement after surgeries. And so we're hoping to be able to see the same result in our patients as well. Um, as part of her psychosocial evaluation, she does talk about treatment planning and does, you know, distribute different resources. But one of the main things is really to make sure that they have referral to uh, an advanced mental health care specialist if needed. So if there's somebody that needs to be seen by a psychiatrist, needs pharmacotherapy, can be initiated at this time. For those of you who are interested in hearing a little bit more about these program and these techniques, uh, both Emily and Vicki will be presenting an ACHA webinar in December. The uh, website for the Adult Congenital Heart Association is listed there. Anybody can listen, it's completely free, and they're gonna talk a little bit more about the data that they have um, in addition to the importance of this. So one of the things that extended from this is a little bit of a change in an annual educational symposium that we do. So adult congenital heart disease in the 21st century, this is a regional educational symposium that we've held at DC for seven years now. This was the seventh year that we'd run it. Uh, it had previously really been directed towards um, healthcare providers, but this year we decided to change things up and had a second day that included patients and families in addition to providers as well too, to again facilitate education and also to improve sort of the interaction between providers and patients and their families. And it, really was a wonderful day. Mon, I wasn't sure if you'd be here, so I took your picture out. Mon uh, assisted us by coming and giving several lectures. Um, but it was really, it was, a, it was a wonderful day. We had great attendance. We usually have about 150 to 170 providers that come. And this year, we had a total of 220 attendees uh, because of the addition of the uh, patients and families as well, too. Um, during the session, we actually had a number of sessions that were led by patients. And so there was a session on uh, female reproductive health and uh, on uh, body image and body acceptance. This is one of our patients who presented her story. I have to say we all felt very inadequate about this. This is Shelby, who is 35 years old, who uh, has transposition of the great arteries and a status post of mustard. And she showed her, shared her story of how a few years ago she decided that she really wanted to take uh, as much ownership of her health as she could and decided to set a goal of competing in you know, some sort of bodybuilding competition. Um, and she did it. So over the course of two years, she got herself into peak physical shape. She feels fantastic, even though if you looked at her echo, you might be very surprised by that. Um, and it's, you know, it's really amazing. I don't know if you can see from the slide, but she actually has a tattoo around her scar as well, too. And so talked quite a bit about body acceptance and issues um, for women as they, as they grow older. And uh, I think it was very inspirational, especially for the adolescent females that were in the audience as well. 
The success of this program really, it has grown and has sustained over the years really because, not just because of our group, but because of um, really the input from the mid-Atlantic region. So DC is a little bit different than Atlanta is in terms of adult congenital programs in that we have a lot of programs and a lot of providers. So when I started at DC in 2011, we decided to try and host a meeting bringing together some of the local area programs. So we uh, hosted and then invited programs from Maryland uh, and then some of the neighboring programs in Virginia um, came as well to University of Virginia and King's Daughters is actually a little bit of a distance but they were interested in coming. And the Pennsylvania programs heard that we were meeting and they said, well, you're not meeting without us, we're coming too. So they joined us as well. And this has really expanded. I, I have to say I, can't, I wasn't quite expecting this. Um, we um, end up uh, having hosting meetings every three to four months. Um, and over the years, really, it's expanded beyond the Maryland, uh, Virginia, and Philadelphia or Pennsylvania area and has included various different programs from really all across the East Coast. Uh, some of them are just you know, independent practitioners who are at private practices, others are at small, more small programs, other from large programs. Um, and it's really built uh, a great sense of collegiality. Um, some of the strengths is that you know, it, I really feel that this has improved patient care. So for people like Olivia, that's almost our everyday practice in adult congenital, not necessarily having a precedent of what to do. And, Having a set of providers to be able to discuss your case with just to see whether or not they've seen this before or what's worked for them has really, I think, been um, the strength of this uh, collaboration. In addition, we're all able to sort of uh, lean on each other for program development. All of the programs are in various stages of development, and so we've been able to utilize different protocols that have been used at different places um, to be able to facilitate growth. Um, our educational program definitely has been strengthened. We have representatives that come from all of the programs, not only to speak, but to attend as well, and certainly improved collegiality and camaraderie. We really haven't been doing a, a ton of research in this group, but certainly there's capacity for that as well. So let's go back to baby Olivia. So that night she ended up getting crashed onto ECMO. And we didn't really know what was gonna happen at that point. Um, she ended up spending uh, a total of 10 months in the hospital. So she was on ECMO for a period of time, was able to be decannulated, did get some graft function back, uh, and eventually was able to be discharged home. Had a trach and a G-tube at that time. And we really did not have any you know, insight on what to be able to tell her parents. This was the first reported case that had survived. We weren't sure exactly what was gonna happen. Um, which then takes me into, I think, the next puzzle piece. So research is so important in congenital heart disease, and certainly for adult congenital patients, there is very little information that is out there um, about long-term outcomes. Um, there's certainly more information that is growing, but this is really a top priority within the field. Um, our individual program research, we have maintained an active database and we have uh, quite a bit of clinical follow-up questionnaires that we utilize for project generation. Um, we have done a lot of research focused uh, on program design and I'm happy to say all of my staff members have their own individual projects and interests that we've been able to facilitate by using these various different sources. So um, we've been able to present our work really at uh, just about all of the major meetings over the past uh, two to three years. Um, and I'm very happy to say that it's not just the physicians that are presenting, but even our coordinators and our research assistants are as well too. Um, and it's been great to see our fellows really get more interested in adult congenital heart disease and have the tools to be able to provide for them to start up projects. I think nationally there are a number of different things that have presented um, as barriers to surveillance and long-term outcomes research. So one of the things is loss to follow-up. Um, a lot of patients drop out of care in that 12 to 18 year old period and so it's very hard to do long-term outcomes research if you don't really know what your N is um, and you're studying you know, a bit of a skewed population. If you look at the data that's out there, this is again from Ariane Morelli's group from about 10 years ago um, looking at the uh, Quebec databases. Um, if you look at patients who have been followed uh, from less than uh, age six years of age, by the time they make it to 18, there are only about 40% that are still in care with a cardiologist, which is pretty remarkable, especially in a system where, you know, you do have a nationalized healthcare system and a way of tracking patients. Um, so you can only imagine what it's like here in the U.S. 
When we look at data from our program, this is, um, if you look at the red line, those are the patients that are seen by our pediatric cardiology colleagues, and then the blue line is uh, seen by our program. You can see that there has been a shift over the past um, five to six years. We don't have a set transi uh, transition age as you do here with um, Sibley, but we have great colleagues in our pediatric cardiology practice partners, and they really believe in the adult congenital program, believe in transition, uh, and you would think by the numbers it looks like there's been a success in the sense that there has really been, you know, a shift in who is caring for these patients. But when you actually start looking at the numbers of patients who are cared for by our practice partners who are between the age of 12 to 18, our number should be quite a bit higher. The blue line should be quite a bit higher. Um, and my suspicion is, is that many of those patients are dropping out of care. And we get anywhere from 10 to 20 new patient referrals. These are new to our system, not patients that are transferred within the system. Um, and if you take a look, at least half of those patients had care at our hospital at one point, uh, but are no longer, you know, receiving care with a con within a congenital center. So it's, it's a big problem, I think, across the board. Um, and it's, it's not a matter of whether or not the cardiologists buy into the idea of having an adult congenital practice. So this then um, set the launch for a new type of transition program. Previously, our transition program involved a transition cardiologist that would assist with the transition process. It usually involved a couple of extra visits or it involved a second transition step that just didn't work in our system. Um, and so since we have been heavily utilizing telemedicine within various aspects of our division, uh, we decided to launch this telemedicine transition program, which is currently in the design phases right now. Um, so a referral would come into our program. Our coordinator would then begin the uh, program scheduling and then would give an introduction about the program itself. All patients and their families would go through a set of assessments. Uh, after this, uh, our social worker, Emily Stein, would then do an initial family patient assessment, and then a care plan would be designed by our team with designated telemedicine visits, um, and then there would be a reassessment. So there would be a set of visits depending on what the needs are of that particular patient, but at minimum, there would be a yearly visit to sort of reassess and see what would be needed going forward. So we're very excited about this program. It's something I think utilizing all members of our team in addition to utilizing our new telemedicine services that are available in cardiology. This would be a direct to consumer platform. Um, some patients would have an individualized program whereas others will probably fall into just a standardized care plan. And we have a number of different educational components that have been developed by our team that are currently being published now that would be utilized uh, as part of this program. So next barrier, number of different barriers to surveillance and long-term outcomes research. So as all of you know, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity within congenital heart disease, lots of different diagnosis and anatomical substrates with changing treatment strategies. So it's very hard to do single center studies to be able to look at outcomes of these patients. You just don't have the numbers. And within the various different types of defects, you can have people who have had various different types of treatment strategies. So again, different populations that you're taking a look at. So really, to be able to conduct research within uh, congenital heart disease, you need to have networks. You need to have multicenter collaboration. So the Alliance for Adult Research uh, in Congenital Cardiology was started back in 2006 for this purpose. Uh, the goal is really to promote collaboration amongst investigators and institutions to advance knowledge, uh, promote innovation, and Im improve outcomes in ACHD. The group itself started off, I think there were eight or nine uh, institutions. Wendy, I think Emory Bryan was part of the initial cohort that founded this group as well, too. Um, it has since grown quite rapidly. We have over 50 members uh, representing 34 institutions. The group's been very productive with over 20 publications. There are, I think, I believe three active grants that are going on right now. Um, and we officially had uh, achieved nonprofit status back in 2015. Um, the group has a pretty broad reach across North America, uh, and there are two Canadian centers that are part of the group as well, too. I may be missing a few stars. Um, and there are representatives really from uh, all parts of the country. Uh, some institutions have more than one uh, representative, but for the most part, um, I think we have pretty good representation amongst all of the major programs across the country, which is great. The group teamed up with the NHLBI and the Adult Congenital Heart Association back in 2014, which resulted in this publication a couple of years later, 
determining what the emerging research directions were in ACHD, they came up with a standard or with a set of recommendations of high priority topic areas. Um, I served as president of ARC from 2016 to 2018, and we ended up uh, taking those initiatives and then designing a key stakeholder meeting uh, focused on designing uh, patient-centered research in ACHD. So our group, we ended up subdividing them into various different focus areas. Each group was tasked with coming up with a protocol addressing one of the topic areas. Um, we then uh, had experts come in from the NIH and the FDA, uh, in addition to patients as well too, and other experts in their subgroup fields to provide sort of a mock grant review and to help with protocol development. And as a result of that meeting, there were a total of eight grants that were submitted. One of the exciting projects that came of this uh, is a study on neurocognitive uh, deficits in adult patients, in adult congenital heart patients. And this was developed and is going to be launched in collaboration with the Pediatric Heart Network. It's actually the first adult congenital heart study that's been picked up by the Pediatric Heart Network. Wendy, tell me we have a launch date yet. Do we have a launch date yet? Hopefully January. Yay, great. So we actually had submitted two proposals to the Pediatric Heart Network for consideration. And so once this launches, our plan is to submit the um, is to submit the uh, next proposal, which is the uh, uh, one on uh, exercise training in the Fontan population. So ARC also uh, works very closely with the other international uh, ACHD research collaboratives. Um, we actually had a meeting, uh, a session at the um, ACHD symposium, the International ACHD Symposium in June that I led that uh, brought together representatives from all of these different associations trying to think of ways that we could potentially collaborate. One of the strengths that the Alliance for Adult Research in Congenital Cardiology has had is really leveraging our collaborations. So we work very strongly with the Adult Congenital Heart Association. And more recently, we've developed um, a uh, strong working relationship with Cornet. Um, so this developed really uh, into a um, way to tackle one of the other barriers to surveillance and long-term outcomes and has been long been a priority for adult congenital heart disease. I don't know about you, Wendy, but it seems like every meeting that I would go to that was always, we, we need a registry, we need a registry, we need a registry. A registry would be great, a registry would be great. I don't think I've gone to a research meeting that that hasn't been a topic at the end and then it usually you know, ends at that. So we're hoping it's not gonna end at that this time. Um, the collaboration with uh, PCORnet, um, how many people here are aware of PCORnet, have worked with PCORnet? So it's a series of partner networks. Um, I'm told it encompasses about a third of the US population. Data is stored in common data elements. Um, for the clinical networks, uh, EMR is used both inpatient and outpatient data to generate these common data elements. And a unique feature, which I'm not 100% sure is true for all of the various networks, but I'm told that patients are asked if they would be willing to be approached by researchers um, depending on what the topic area is, if they fit within the, within the scope of that project, which I think is, is very exciting if that's true. So PCORnet and uh, adult congenital heart disease, how did this happen? Well, so PCORnet has designated collaborative research groups, and each of those are further subdivided into research interest groups. And so there is a cardiovascular health uh, uh, research group, and as part of that, there was an adult congenital heart disease research interest group that was spearheaded by Dr. Ari Cedars, who's now at UT Southwestern. Um, they then brought to us, to ARC, uh, a request for collaboration and trying to bring together uh, key stakeholders. And so the group that really has taken the lead on this is one of the patient-powered research networks, the Healthy Heart Alliance. Anybody here familiar with the Healthy Heart Study? So the Healthy Heart Study is a study that is launched uh, and is part of the alliance um, that uh, has a uh, patient-generated uh, research registry as part of the, part of the actual um, project. And so what the alliance wanted to do was really sort of spearhead research the topics in adult congenital heart disease. And so they requested us as ARC to really help them with designing a patient-powered research summit, which occurred this uh, past March. 
This was an interactive research design workshop, and there were two priority topic areas. One was hypertension, and the adult was con uh, the other was adult congenital heart disease. I have to say, we all probably were quite floored that we were included as one of those two priority topic areas, but um, definitely took advantage of it. There were about 25 patients or advocacy representatives that came, and five of us went as ARC researchers um, and really tried to facilitate um, some research design. So the goal was really to develop research ideas utilizing PCORnet uh, with an eventual proposal submission for a preliminary data search across the entire PCORnet system. And I'm happy to say that um, our proposal was funded, and so we're waiting for the return of the data set now, but this is what we had requested from them. So a, a pretty, um, pretty intensive data search looking at 10 different comorbidities in addition to trying to get an idea of complex versus non-complex CHD within the PCORnet system. So we're excited to see this. Uh, the results from this, as I think this will be the launch of a lot of you know great ideas and research to come. So as a result of that, the next step is that the Healthy Heart Network really wanted to try and launch a uh, specific ACHD registry, especially as we're going to be collecting data across the whole system. And so that's the that's the next meeting organization. Um, so on December 3rd, uh, a number of us are going to get together at Washington, D.C. for a key stakeholder meeting. ARC is uh, the group that is really driving this, but in addition, we're going to have close involvement by uh, PCORnet, including the <coughs> Alliance and also something called a patient cause group. So the Alliance has various different uh, cause groups that are comprised by patients and key stakeholders, and so this, these will be the three groups that will really be driving forward um, the development of this registry. The Adult Congenital Heart Association will be closely involved, as will some federal funding agencies. Uh, and we'd like to build in as much synergy as possible, and so representatives from other uh, data registries will also be coming, some focused on congenital heart disease, some not focused on congenital heart disease. Um, we've, uh, we've had some uh, generous offers from the American College of Cardiology to host this meeting, so this will be held in D.C. Uh, in about a month and a half. So we're hoping that this will be the launch of, of the next phase of what's needed as a research priority within ACHD. So let's go back to baby Olivia. We really didn't have a lot to offer her and her family in terms of prognosis. Um, when she went home, we really didn't know what was going to come of her. We didn't know what her neurodevelopmental status was going to be. We didn't know what her long-term survival was going to be. Um, I have to say there's something to be said about you know survival protoplasm, the people that survive these type of complex, uh, complex uh, lesions. Um, so she went on to do quite well. Um, this was her at eight years of age as uh, Tinkerbell in her school play, and this was a picture of her uh, a year ago uh, in her new role as a school cheerleader. Um, she's made a, you know, a remarkable recovery and has had a, you know, really a remarkable course in terms of progress, and I stay in touch with her and her family pretty regularly, so I'm happy to see that she's doing well. Um, my training is that of a pediatric cardiologist, but all of you might be wondering why is it that I just presented a story of a pediatric case in a, in a, in a talk that's supposed to be focused on adult congenital heart disease. So I, I focused on Olivia's case because this is really the story of most of our patients. If you start talking to adult congenital heart patients, what you'll end up hearing is stories of little kids who were told that they would never finish high school or that you know they really didn't know uh, what was going to happen uh, for their long-term outcomes. And then they end up going on not only to finish high school, but also to graduate college, have very wonderful careers. This is Senator Dick Durbin, for those of you who don't know. Uh, go on to get married, start families of their own, and celebrate milestone birthdays that they never really thought that they would achieve You'll hear stories of little girls who were told that they would never be able to have uh, children, would never be able to start families of their own, who go on to have healthy and successful pregnancies and achieve their dreams of having kids and starting their own families. You'll hear stories of patients who were told that they would never be athletes, that they'd never be able to exercise, that they'd always have to be somewhat of an invalid who then go on to complete marathons and rock climb and sail. So Jeff is one of my patients and he puts us to shame every time when he comes in. He comes in and says, Dr. John, 
It's all going downhill. I just, I don't know. We're going to have to start like the transplant workup. What's the matter, Jeff? Well, I can only run four or five miles now, whereas like a year ago, I could run six or seven, to which we're like, you're probably OK. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's quite empowering, although I have to say, I think one of his greatest accomplishments is uh, uh, celebrating over 30 years with his wife. Um, you'll also hear of stories of patients who, again, had no idea that they would make it to 65 years of age, who really just want to enjoy the common things in life. So Renzo is someone who I met when we first started, I first started at Children's, who at the time was very, very, very sick. Um, his daughter was in high school at the time, and um, we really didn't think that he would have much by way of life expectancy. He also underwent a type of hybrid procedure. He was one of the first cases in the country that um, he had a pulmonary artery band and a melody valve placed in the right ventricular outflow tract, and then also had a melody valve in his tricuspid valve as well. Um, that was done with the help of some of our colleagues at uh, Children's Hospital of Boston. Um, and that was five years ago. And his um, goal at that time really was just to be able to see his daughter graduate college, which he did this past May. Uh, he is also now retired and is off traveling the world with his wife, uh, living, you know, living every day. Um, it gives you a real appreciation for life, I think, you know, working with these folks, because they really just want to be able to appreciate the ordinary. So this takes me to the last puzzle piece. Most of the time, folks have advocacy listed here. I'm actually going to change that and talk about teamwork. Um, to take care of these patients, it definitely it takes a village. Um, I don't know how Wendy and her team feel, but this is oftentimes how we feel. <laughs> um, it can be really, really difficult. Uh, and uh, I feel like this every day. <laughs> um, but it is you know, something that you really need. You can't do it alone. You need a team of people to, to help you. Um, and I'm blessed to have a really great team of people that work with me. Um, this is a quote that I think kind of embodies our team. The strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team. Um, we're a very diverse group of people. Sometimes we like to live on the edge. This is our nurse coordinator in the race car, uh, and that's my colleague Sage Ito there. There, were no pa there was no patient care involved in either of these pictures. This is not how we transport our patients although it probably would be faster. Um, sometimes we get tired and we need to take a rest. This is Seiji after I made him take call for three weeks in a row after he first arrived, because I had been on call for the better part of the year <laughs> prior to that. Um, but for the most part, we're you know a team of people that really enjoys working with each other um, and really enjoys what we do, have a, you know, a common mission. And I have to say, from a personal standpoint, really, the reason why I'm able to be involved with so many different national initiatives and trying to piece together the puzzle is because I have, you know, my team standing behind me. So, so if coming together is beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success, I'm very proud to say that we have been a success. And so with that, um, I will end. I have to say thank you to a few people. Uh, Dr. Barul and Dr. Jonas is the chief of uh, cardiology and chief of CT surgery at our program. Um, certainly our whole Heart Institute at Children's National. Um, you know, we care for a lot of our patients at the Children's Hospital, which really puts a lot of our providers outside of their comfort zone, but they really believe in the mission of our program and uh, they really support um, the initiatives that we've put into place. Certainly our colleagues at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and then also thanks to all of our patients who agreed um, to share their stories for this talk. And with that, I will, with that, I will end. Happy to take questions. That was a, a wonderful talk and a very comprehensive overview of what we do every day or try to achieve every day and how much further we have to go as a subspecialty. Uh, one of the issues I think some of the internal medicine house staff struggle with is the psychosocial issues. And uh, as you pointed out, some of these patients do have PTSD from their childhood experiences. How do you advise the house staff that are not involved with these patients every day in regards to managing some of those, some of that anxiety in the hospital? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great 
point, I, some of our patients are actually still admitted to the children's hospital. So on top of the internal medicine house staff at the adult hospital, the pediatric house staff really have no like basis for on how to, you know, how to sort of interact with an adult patient who might be, um, you know, not responding in a way that they think might be appropriate. For us anyway, what we have really advised is um, to quickly to get us involved. Uh, we do find that having that continuity of care really does help. So even if we're not the active managers on the floor for whatever their issue is, I think just even seeing someone from our team often does help bring a bit of calm to the situation. The other thing too is that um, we've had um, our social workers work pretty in depth with them. So many times they know them as well too personally. And if they don't, um, they still have the background to be able to come in and talk with them. So I often tell house staff not to go it alone and that, you know, first impulse sometimes depending on what the reaction is to get angry uh, thinking that this is an adult patient not responding appropriately or not acting rationally but it's really from a place of you know some underlying inability to cope with what's going on and to really get someone involved that has the training to uh, assist with that um, and to not you know take that primary responsibility on themselves. battery issues today. Um, it's a great talk. So uh, I wanted to ask you about your Fontan board. So I'm sure as you know, when the tumor boards first started, it was about diagnostic accuracy and then about uh, life expectancy and then eventually all sorts of other things. What, what are you tracking from your Fontan board and sort of what kind of outcomes are you, are you hoping uh, to deliver from that? sort of in development now and some of that is actually going to mirror what we decide are things that we're going to track in our national database as well too. So um, some of the minimal things that we've talked about are, you know, long-term morbidities with um, advancing uh, decline of the liver, uh, getting listed for transplantation, um, heart failure symptoms, PLE, plastic bronchitis, obviously death. Um, so we'll be tracking those as sort of a major morbidity bundle, um, but we also will probably be tracking hospitalizations, we'll be tra tracking um, some of the serum lab values that we don't have a lot of baseline knowledge on in the pediatric population because it's not something that's routinely assessed at most visits. Um, so it's a, it's a process in development. Some of it also is going to be some of the psychosocial piece as well too, and I think trying to determine um, you know, when patients are going to be ready for uh, transition and what their level of health knowledge is. Um, and then the other aspect is the neurodevelopmental aspect. So that definitely there are parameters that we uh, would be tracking in terms of their school performance and how they're responding to some of the treatments. So those are some of the general buckets, uh, but still sort of in evolution about what to track. One of the challenges is, is that, um, you know, you're never going to make the Fontan physiology a normal physiology with, in the absence of a pump. And so what are you going to then um, be able to do interventionally? And I, I have to say, I can't say we know for sure in terms of medical management, although there are a number of studies that are coming out now looking at pulmonary vasodilators in the younger population that we may have more information about in terms of when to institute treatments. But a lot of this, you know, even for programs that are already underway, um, it's sort of trying to pick the best things that you can think think of going forward. Thank you. Um, is there any effort or interest in building sort of a biobank, stem cell bank, or any kind of banks um, with the clinical network that you've established and um, what the limitations and challenges are to that? Yeah, so there are definitely interests. A number of the centers that participate within ARC have their own biobanks. So Boston Children's has a pretty active uh, biobank that saw, was Sasha Bataski has, um, I don't know if he manages it per se, but he certainly was one of the driving forces in creating it. Uh, there are a few other places that do as well too. One of the challenges with the ARC group is that, you know, this really started as kind of a grassroots um, eight or nine investigators that got together to really try and pull data. And so, you know, we're, uh, we probably expanded more rapidly than expected over the past few years. So trying to find a home base of where to be able to house these type of things, whether it's going to be at a particular institution or whether it's going to be at a research institution, 
Um, I think also through the uh, Bench to Bassinet program, there is a mechanism for being able to collect um, samples for genetic analysis. So that may be a way to potentially be able to pool forces and combine forces to be able to establish, if not a biobank, um, you know, certainly a, a gene repository for patients across the board. So there are a lot of possibilities. I think that's the exciting thing about congenital heart disease, especially for folks like you who are still training. I used to be one of the young investigators. Now I'm solidly middle-aged. So we're depending on all of you young ones coming up with new energy to think of ways to be able to tackle those problems. But there are a lot of um, potential collaborations to be able to make that happen. Um, one of the things uh, with uh, patients who have congenital heart disease is they run into uh, physicians who are not accustomed to caring for them. And so there's misunderstandings about someone who has, you know, severe pulmonary hypertension, and that data gets tracked over to, to the prognosis related to primary pulmonary hypertension, that sort of thing. What, what is your group doing to sort of um, educate uh, just around some basic issues within primary care that um, or to uh, initial healthcare providers um, to sort of demystify some of the management because certainly a lot of the care does need to be very subspecialized as far as deciding what an additional procedure might a patient need or that type of thing. But there are some basic things that when, when a patient with a Fontan presents with volume overload, heart failure, you know. They sort of need diuretics, so, so it's, it, it can be kind of simplified as, as, as well. But could, could you comment on if there's been a focus on what to do with preventing mistakes in the emergency department, putting patients on oxygen who, you know, that, that type of thing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and we run into that. I think every program in the country probably runs into that all the time. So what we've tried to do, one of the reasons why we established that regional program was really to be able to provide education um, for any provider within the area. And we were surprised to see that there were a lot of nurses that would come from all over. It wasn't just, you know, nurses from our program or necessarily nurses from congenital heart programs that were coming. Um, they were coming from, you know, a variety of different institutions, local community hospitals as well. Um, so that was one uh, start to be able to try and tackle that, to be able to offer those type of educational programs. We recorded those as well, too, and have provided that to learning labs that are, you know, broadcast uh, and available across the country for providers. Um, we've also done a lot more grassroots efforts, so we do a ton of grand rounds every year, both myself. Uh, my colleague, Seiji Ito, our nurse practitioner, um, Rachel Sturry, we go out and give talks not just to cardiology divisions, but to internal medicine programs, to OBGYN divisions, um, some to general pediatrics as well, too. And so between all of those things, we've been able to get at least our name out there so that there's a contact information for folks to be able to call. And uh, one of us is always carrying a, a cell phone that's accessible 24-7, and so we frequently get calls from um, the area from providers or from emergency rooms just because they have that contact information. It's not the best way to go about doing it. The other thing that I think we need to do is really facilitate more, um, more educational program that's coming from the Adult Congenital Heart Association. So they obviously need medical backing to be able to give that, but they potentially could have a broader reach, especially with patients as well too to be able to make sure that they know where to go when they need assistance and where they go where they go when they need subspecialized assistance as well too it's um it's a difficult you know it's a it's a difficult uh, problem to solve but some of it also i think once patients are sort of empowered to know that okay I, you can't do that I, without talking to someone else about that um, i think that's also been quite helpful as well so accessibility and then trying to really kind of get um, the word out as much as possible and not really restricting it just to cardiac providers, I think, has been a key thing for us anyway in the area. Thank you for such a great talk. I just wanted to ask you about the kind of question of transition because I think it remains a huge problem for almost every group in the country, really. I know that the uh, pediatric group here has done such a good job kind of having these clinics all throughout the state, and I think we lose a lot of patients when they try to transition here because no one wants to come to the big city. I just wanted to get your ideas on the, how your telemedicine program has kind of helped and if, if it's really improved the rate of transition that you all have seen. 
Yeah, we won't know yet because we actually just launched this program. So up until the head of transition actually just retired back in June. And so previously we had sort of a clinic model that was not successful for the exact reason that you said is that it would involve multiple clinic visits, involve more travel, sometimes involve a trip down to DC, which nobody wants to drive into DC. Um, so we're hoping this is going to help with that. We, as the adult congenital program, have established um, satellite clinics at all of the major sites that we see pediatric patients as well, too. I think we're about to launch into Virginia in the next month or so. Um, so we've tried to establish clinics at those, you know, sort of periphery areas so that people have a way to, uh, way to come in. But um, stay tuned to see if the telemedicine program is a, has a better. The, previous um, model was not a successful model in terms of percentage of patients transferred over. So we're hoping this will have a little bit of a better system. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.